<laughs> What's up, guys? Uh, Mumford and Kid here, coming to you again. How's everybody doing on there? And hope you had a very happy Thanksgiving. I'm here to deliver my review for the books that came up for the final week of November, and of course, to kick off the winner of this month's surprise giveaway. Um, once again, like I said, every time you leave a comment, you leave a comment on on the uh, on my reviews, not the haul videos. On my reviews, you get entered into my surprise giveaway. Now, last last time I did this, the first time uh, Lamar Dagger Wolf won because I had to do it over because of the situation that came up. Um, Lamar, like I said, it's on the way. Uh, and finally, the, the cyborg statue is finally in stock. It's, it was on back order for me, so I sh it, it should be coming soon. I, I have to give you the tracking number, bro. <clears throat> but back again, I got a lot to talk about. Um, first thing I want to do is answer the question. Um, that I have somebody asked me a question on Twitter and who watches my reviews His name is uh, Peter peak 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 J Guster at PJ Guster okay um, you asked me who inspired you to do your reviews oh that's an easy question right there uh, my bro, uh, Blue Goblin 01, check out his reviews. Um, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't do my reviews now. I wouldn't be a hundred plus episodes strong with my reviews. Like I said, um, Gobby is one of my best friends. Um, one of the best friends I ever made and never met him. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, care a great deal about him, I love him, He's, um, I love him, I love his girlfriend, Jennifer, you know, um, always support him no matter what, and uh, like I said, I saw him do it, and I'm like, you know what, I think I could do that too, so well, let me give it a shot, so I did, and uh, people enjoyed my take on my opinion on books even if they don't agree with anything at least I'm being honest I keep it 100% real um, if I don't like a book I don't like it if I like it I like it if you don't like it that's fine I'm not gonna debate too much with anybody's opinions as always opinions will vary that's what makes it great um, that's just me okay so, uh, let's get on with the title, shall we? Let's do this. Um, don't mind Gwen in the back. She's just chilling out. Hey, right, Gwen? Looking forward to that book, too. Alright, so, we got a good deal to talk about. Alright, so, uh, let's kick this bad boy off real quick, shall we? So, we're going to... Go in, we're gonna go from indies to DC, end it with Marvel. Start off with uh, the Sky Sentinel, Captain Midnight, number seventeen. Uh, Joshua Williamson and uh, F F uh, Fernando Dag Dagnito does the artwork. This is a new story arc. Um, first of all, like I said, I love that cover. Pretty, that nice cover. So, in this issue, um, Captain Midnight is finally going out on a date. You know, remember, he's from the 40s. He was stuck in the Bermuda Triangle. He got trapped there. Um, and then he came back out, and it's 2014. He's on a date. He's really got to catch up with the times. You can see he's really, they really play up that man out of time. You know, this girl, 
the girl he's dating, you know, he's going on a date is saying like, you know, you, know, you ever seen Casablanca and things like that? He's like, the city of Morocco? She's like, no, the movie. And he's like, what? What movie? You know, things like that, you know. Um, you know, she, so she, he has to play it up. Later on, some of his people of his, uh, allies of his find a person that may know where the person who sent him, who caused him to get trapped in a beautiful little tribe is. So, it's, what's that saying? You know, the enemy of my enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, this kind of gets played up with him. But Captain Midnight is no fool. Genius. Genius he is. He realized, okay, I helped this guy, but it's going to be on my terms. So, one thing he does um, for the uh, villain, what is the villain's name? I'm forgetting his name. Uh, Um, uh, Helios, that's his name. Um, this is what he looks like. He brings Helios back to the headquarters, and he, uh, from it, he's upset. He's upset at his team, like, what the hell, you bring this killer here, and things like that. And, you know. The thing he does is Captain Midnight actually invents a metal arm for his prosthetic arm for it, because Helios is uh, left, he has no left arm, I think. However, when Helios tries to bolt, Captain Midnight is like, eh, eh, you're not going anywhere. I put a failsafe in your metallic arm. If you try to bolt, it's going to like literally reject you back to me. And I was like, that's badass right there. Um... So really, Captain Midnight needs uh, Helios, uh, but a very good start for this new story arc. I really enjoyed it. All right, move on to uh, Conan, the Avenger number eight, the Damned Horde. Fred Midnight still uh, tells a good story with Conan. Um, like I said, Conan being one of the greatest. Barbarian characters ever created. Um, thank you, Mr. Robert E. Howard. Thank you very much. Uh, for, but um, in this issue, um, Conan and his gang, his uh, his men, invade a city to literally help one of their own. Um, a, the former slave girl that is with Conan, her name is. Um, uh, Di Di uh, Diana. They go to rescue Diana's sister, who is also a slave in another city. And it looks like everything is starting to go off according to plan. And, you know, Conan and his men are taking out, literally besieging the whole city. Right underneath the, the king's nose and everything like that. Um, however, things start to go amiss. And shit starts hitting the fan. And it kind of ends on that dun 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 moment. Like, what is Conan and his his loyal, loyal warriors going to do next? But other than that, real good stuff. Very much enjoyed it. Alright. Last Dark Hawk book. Tomb Raider number 10. Uh... Yeah, Simone, lady, and uh, uh, Rihanna, R Rihanna uh, Patcher, I'm going to pronounce her name right again, uh, ends this with, uh, last time we left off, Laura was in Chernobyl, she's in Chernobyl, and uh, she's able to meet a family that did not leave the area when Chernobyl went into meltdown back in the 80s. They still live on the grounds and everything like that. And uh, Laura befriends them. Unfortunately, uh, the man she was looking for by the name of uh, I'm forgetting his name. Um, 
Cruz, the guy, <coughs> he uh, bombards the house with a black, with a, uh, bombards with missiles from a Black Hawk uh, helicopter. And luckily, unfortunately, some things go bad. And however, there are some survivors and there are some deaths in here. I'm not going to spoil who they are. But uh, Laura, we get to see Laura use her head in this, especially when, you know, Cruz thinks he's killed her. A lot of action in this issue, action packed. Uh, you see Laura get down, and I'm talking get down, and to the point you just like, you really like, go Laura, you know, um, and that's the ending of this, that was like, you're just like, what the fuck, like, what, like, so, it left on a cliffhanger, but it was like a, you had to give a double take, like, what, like, whoa, like, good stuff, all right, So I tweeted this bad boy on, on my Twitter. Um, Action Lab Entertainment presents Midnight Tiger number two. Like I said, read the first issue way back before it even became under Action Labs. Um, uh, Anthony, Ryan, Anthony Height, and everybody who worked on this, this was good. Uh, this was just as good as the second one, uh, the first issue. Uh, Tiger is uh, kidnapped and uh, he gets led into a trap and he's brought back to one of the uh, one of the mob bosses in um, what's the city called uh, Apollo Bay. Um, his name is T Stone. I mean P Stone. Uh, the P stands for power. Get it? And Midnight Tiger and P-Stone uh, actually have it out. And um, it doesn't go too well for Mid uh, Midnight Tiger. But he's also introduced to another legion of heroes. And uh, I'm not going to spoil who the, what those heroes are or who they are. But um, this was really good. And then they, and it also um, it was a lot of fun. I will agree at times the 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 dialogue does feel a little little outdated. Um, it does feel maybe a little too 90-ish, but other than that, still good. Everybody worked on this issue great. I'm um, looking forward to issue three, and I'm also looking forward to um I'm also looking forward to. Uh, th this other title that's coming out soon called Stray. So that looks pretty interesting too. But uh, I'm not sure about that. The <laughs> I got to get used to the heroes' names in there. But uh, this was good. Very good indeed. Like I said, it still has that Spider Man static feel to it, which I like. Just like this. sometimes the dialogue does feel a little bit outdated. Uh, Lazarus number thirteen, Greg Roker, uh, Lark. Oh my God, this continues to be good. Um, so Forever is still at the kind of the ball that's going on. All the other families in this world are there, including their Lazaruses, uh, their uh, genetically engineered bodyguards. They represent each family. The main focus also is on Forever, and we're seeing that Forever is starting to show feelings for one of the other Lazarus. Uh, uh, Jaquim, who is the Lazarus for another family, and he feels the same way. They do share a kiss, which is really interesting, and the dialogue is so good. You really feel for Forever in terms of like she was built and bred and trained just to be a protector, to be a 
quote unquote the muscle, the the head honcho, the big gun, the killer, quote unquote. So when she's really like saying to Jack him like, look, um, I sh you know I don't I've never you, you're my first kiss and I I want to do it again and it's like you're like wow you know you, you really feel for her, but um. It's also something at the end of this issue that um, Forever does to her brother, and it was just like, oh man. But other than that, Lazarus continues to shine. 13 issues in, it's still not too late to jump on board with this title. Good stuff. Move on to IDW, and uh, we're going to TN. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 40. Uh, like I said, I got the Eastman cover. Like I said, um, Kevin Eastman, Walt, just doing a fucking fantastic job with this title. The way they wrote Bebop and Rocksteady in this title reminded me too much, but in a good way, of when the X-Men first encountered the Juggernaut. How powerful and unstoppable he was. That is how they did. And I swear to you right now, I've said it before and I'll say it again. When if they ever bring Bebop and Rocksteady to the new cartoon that's out now, please do them like this. Because it would work. Instead of making them the comic reliefs like they did in the 80s. Don't get me wrong, I'm an 80s brat. I grew up with that series. And I'll never forget uh, Say Your Prayers titles, you know, things like that. But I want them to do Bebop and Rocksteady how when they first came onto the series, they were kind of taken more seriously. They weren't as a joke but later in the later, latter uh, seasons, things like that. But in this, it literally takes Every, every, the Turtles, Old Hub, uh, Mondo Gecko, uh, Amoplex comes back. So many people come just to fight Bebop and Rocksteady. And one of their heavy hitters, it, I will say this, one of their heavy hitters is taken out of the fight kind of early because he saved Mikey. Slash is taken out kind of early, but still... Bebop and Rocksteady was done so well. They made Waltz and and uh, Eastman made them very, very imposing. Like I said, they felt like it felt like I was reading. It felt like when I was watch, reading them, it felt like the Turtles was fighting two juggernauts, so to speak. And it came off. I mean, spoiler free. They dropped the fucking building on top of Bebop and Rocksteady. And they walked, they got out like it was nothing. But uh, as good as that was, it's that goddamn ending, and I say that in a good way, that you just look at and you're like, you're like, holy shit, I can't believe he did that. But it was good. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 40. Pick this bad boy up, please. I guarantee you, you will not regret it. Keep it with Turtles. TNG Mutant Turtles Ghostbusters 2. Uh, Burham and Waltz do the writing. The artwork. Really good in here. I like the way, um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, then uh, Shroholen draws the turtles in this. Um, so the two, the Fab Foursome meets the Ghostbusters. Finally, they meet each other for the first time. Um, and uh, Egon, Ray, Winston, and Peter think that the turtles are like, like uh, manifestations, you know, until so they start seeing that they're talking to them and things like that. Remember, they're still fighting this ghost, this spirit called Chi Yu, who is um, kind of responsible for wh why the turtles are in the Ghostbusters New York. But um, 
basically after a while, you know, the April lets the, the Ghostbusters have it though. She lets she wails on uh Peter and this I was like, Man and I love the line Peter says, Why is it always the redheads that like a, a gangs up on me? Um so many references in this title. Uh, Peter talking about I used to date a girl who used to restore art. I'm like Dana, you know, it's like things like that. We get to see also like who is kind of um, which turtle is kind of with which Ghostbusters, and you'd be surprised who is with who at times. For example. Leo and Winston hit it off. Um, Raph and Bankman, Peter, are more kind of... Ray is kind of... Ray and Egon are kind of equal with Donnie. And Mikey's kind of just in there as, as a whole centerpiece. Um, and we get to see... Um, April and Janine headed off, but they're still worried about Casey. Casey was kidnapped by the, the ghost Chiyo, Chiyu, and he's forcing him to do his bidding. And the turtles, they want to go help their friend. Egon and Ray get into this like battle of the brains of like a ghost reel, things like that, and everything. It's really good, it, well written. Um, very much enjoyed it. Um, the ending is really cool because I was like, I expected that. I'm not going to spoil what it was, but if you go to my Facebook or my Twitter, you will see uh, what I'm talking about. Um, but this was really good. I can't wait to read this this uh, th part three. Um, but good stuff. Jim and Turtles, Ghostbusters 2. Last 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 indie book we go on to Xenoscope with Robin Hood number four Pat Shant my god sir good work good work sir um like I said fucking love those covers look at that you got Robin Hood on cover and then you got Red Riding Hood in the back so yeah that kind of spoils it yes Red Riding Hood is back she comes to New York because she needs Robin's help. Um, when they meet, you know, they're kind of like, hey, hey, you know, they kind of had a, they've been, these two have had like a rocky history. First time they met, they tried to kill each other, things like that. It, it got, it's a kind of, little complicated. But she knows that Robin may can help her. You see, there is an underground kind of a, how can I put it, I guess you could say a creature, monster underground, you know, um, in the underground that is thriving and growing and growing in strength until they start to really run things. It's led by a female werewolf, and um, Red Riding Red needs... Um, Red needs uh, Robin's help, and uh, you see them talk, especially on the train when they're in the subway uh, about Robin get having a personal life, things like that. The beginning of this issue is really funny, um, but without spoiling too much, the ending leaves us once again, and I'm just like, Mr. Shat, I you go, we're gonna do this again, but it's like. I can't hate on it because it was good. Let's move on to DC, shall we? Aquaman number 36. Uh, Maelstrom Part 2. Uh, Jeff Parker does a good job on this. This wasn't bad. Um, it's once again explaining that 
you know, could Arthur's mother be alive? We saw that cliffhanger at the last issue. Um, so Arthur calls in some help to find out. Um, the cover kind of spoils it, so you get to see what it is. Yes, uh, John Jones, Marshall Manhunter, goes, comes in, uh, goes in, comes in disguised as an Atlantean at first, you know, to get some info that he can. He helps, but something bad happens to John, and this, this, uh, cover is not false advertising. This kind of does have where Aquaman and John have to fight. Um, not bad. Like I said, it wasn't great, like, superb, fantastic. Um, but it was good. Uh, it makes you wonder what's coming next, especially with this story arc. But, uh, I still enjoyed it very much. Deathstroke, number two. Um, Tony Daniel. Eye for an eye. Um, this was good. Yes. This was good. I was, um, once again, like I said, if the f first issue really impressed me, this one did too. Um, so, what we saw last time is Slade has, what has been given his youth again. He's no longer an older man, you know, an old man. I wouldn't say old, just because that old man kicked your ass, but he's young again. And it was so funny because he's like, what the hell did you do to me? I'm young. Looks down at his pecker. I am young. And he's like, I was like, stupid, but it was funny as hell, though. Um, and we get to see the person kind of responsible for it. However, this has a little bit of feel of Wolverine because... The person, the sailor that has been talking to him, has done this to Slade, tells him that you kind of work for me now. All your assets, everything you own, everything you, you know, all your hidden accounts, everything, shut down. So literally in a sense, Deathstroke is broke. Even all his safe houses, everything is compromised. So uh, we get to see that Deathstroke has been doing some jobs on the side, but he doesn't remember he doesn't remember it, and um, it's a serum that's been taken by him to kind of get his memory back. He has like a short, kind of short-term memory, and uh, it's really, really good. Um, very much enjoyed it, and it's the ending. Two, dos, two, cliffhanger, like, ooh, whoa, one I will spoil. Um, it looks like what happened, we were, so, the New 52 said that Bronze Tiger wasn't human. And wrong. Because, here's what Bronze Tiger looks like now. And Lady Shiva's in the back. Um, it would seem they've taken a little bit of homage and image of arrows bronze tiger because he has like like claws on his knuckles and things like that and I'm like up oh, here we go but other than that this was good very much flash number 36 trapped in the savage speed force uh Vendetti Jensen Booth all of them everybody on this this was this was good, you know, um, while present day Flash is in this, trapped in a speed force, future Flash is in, in his timeline and has taken over his life. And so he's doing everything that Flash would do in a sense, but, you know, he doesn't know a lot of people. Um, without spoiling too much, um, we get to see that. Future Flash is ain't no joke, um, and he does something at the end of this issue that was just like, you motherfucker, what the fuck is wrong with you? But other than that, it was good. 
E-Man and the Masters of the Universe, uh, number 19, Prelude to Eternity Wars. Um, who does the writing in this? Um, uh, let me try to Rob David. Um, sir, not bad, but I felt like this should have never really been here. In a sense, this shouldn't have been the next issue, like a prelude to the next uh, big story arc. Um, this could have been done way sometime in the earlier issues, because it's almost like it's a beginning for, we get to see the beginnings of Prince Adam, but the thing I, I will admit, it felt nostalgic because a lot of the characters looked like their old 80s selves, you know, um, just a lot of things. We get to see, you know, um, Stratos and Buzz Off in here, um, Beast Man, you know, a lot of different things, but it was good nonetheless. Red Lanterns, number 36. Uh, Soul does the writing, uh, Godhead, Act 2, Part 4. Um, literally, I will agree on what my bro Blue Diamond said on his review. This is literally Guy being Guy, taking the, you know, being unreasonable, thinking that, you know, the only way you deal with somebody is take the fight to them. Excuse me. Um, but, um, they do go for help by uh, Cyborg, him and Simon Boz, to uh, open a boom tube so they can go to a new, uh, new Genesis. And, you know, Cyborg Vic is like, get the hell out of here. You know, get out of here. I, I didn't want you here. And Simon, you get to see that Simon Boz, he may be a Green Lantern and, you know, and things like that, but he's still a grade-A jerk sometimes. Um, he's an asshole. And you see it in this. And, you know, he's literally blackmailing Cyborg to open a, open a, a boom tube or he's going to do something basically to ruin... Vic's father's reputation in a sense. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, are you stupid? Like, and it's like, you don't, you're an asshole. But that's pretty much all this was. And I was just like, you know, as much as, you know, I'm not the, I like Guy Gardner, but he's not my favorite of the human Green Lanterns. You know, it's just like, sometimes it's like, he needs to think first before he acts. Um, because if we were playing a game of chess, guy would be two steps ahead of his competition, but in a bad way. And that would be his downfall. Move on to the Marvel books. Alright. We still good? We still good. Alright. We're going to start this off. Where's all my A? Hey, where's the, where's the A's? Where's the other A's? Um, okay. <coughs> all new Ghost Rider, number uh, nine. Uh, uh, Philip Smith, Philip Smith does the writing. And Damon Scott. His artwork is not bad, but sometimes it just feels like it's too cartoonish for a Ghost Rider. And I'm just like, ah, you know, but the story is good. The spirit that is a part of Robbie Reyes is, um, has taken over his body, which, uh, is, uh, the name is, um, what is his name again? Uh, Eli Morrow. There we go. Eli Morrow. However, he's been going around getting his revenge on the people that done him wrong. However, Eli runs into one of the I would say one of them. I 
because there have been others before him, but he's, you could say he's one of the originals. The original Ghost Rider, Johnny Blaze, and they duke it out. And it feels like old school versus new school in a sense. And let me tell you, what's that old saying I say, guys? You, all my subscribers out there, you know me who, who followed me for a long time. What do I always say? Old school is cool. And we get to see, you no, know, even though this new Ghost Rider or the, the, the spirit that's in this new Ghost Rider has some cool techniques and powers and things like that, and he kind of seems to be having the upper hand on Johnny. Johnny showcases that you can't beat, you can't beat, <coughs> excuse me, good old experience, or what I like to call the penance stare. And Johnny gives him the penance stare, and it's done. It's over. Finito. Adios. See you later. Bye. And... Eli Morrow is, I would say, he, I could, I literally would say, with the pen and stare, Johnny Blaze has exercised the demon. Yeah. And uh, we get to see Robbie come back. And it's here that Johnny gives Robbie the 411 on the Ghost Rider. Johnny is still not really convinced if. Eli, I mean, uh, Robbie is a true ghost rider because there's so many ghost riders. Uh, he even tells them, I'm not the only one. There are many of us. And that's true. There are ghost riders all over the Marvel Universe. There's ghost riders. There's a ghost rider in, in Japan, Africa, London, uh, Russia, Australia, China. You know, it's not just the, 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 uh, the brothers. Johnny and Dan, you know, there are others, and he goes on about it, and he tells him about the Sarathos, he tells, and it's really here that if this really, at this point, it's really as if Johnny is explaining to him, and Robbie is trying to understand him, and understand him well, and it almost feels like Johnny, uh, Robbie has become Johnny's Padawan, that's the best way I can describe it. However, um, Robbie's little brother, who is has um, mental retardation, was left at home by himself because of when Eli Morrow inhabited Robbie's body, and he's on the floor in the bathroom. He's tucked in the fetal position. He's hungry. He doesn't know what to eat. Things like that. Very sad part right there. Very touching at that point. Um, and and then there's uh, some other things that's going on with one of the gangs in L.A. called the Blues, the Blues Gang. Um, but other than that, and it's the ending that that also is crazy too. But other than that, this was good. All New Evaders, number 12. Uh, Robinson still does a good job. We get to see um, the invasion of the, the, uh, the Martians. Uh, during the year 1917, so we get to see one of the uh, the first Union Jack, uh, Orson Randall's uh, Iron Fist. Uh, this is Danny's predecessor. Um, what is the other hero name? Uh, Sir Steel, I guess, who is kind of supposed to be almost like the Black Knight, uh, the Crimson uh, Calvary. And um, we see them dealing with the Martians back then. It's kind of being retold through the eyes of their descendants, who the current Union Jack, Spitfire, and Destroyer. And uh, it was good, you know, nothing. But then, Mr. Robinson, you hit me with a left hook, and I'm like, oh, that was good. I can't believe you brought that character back, Mr. Robinson. Great age stuff right there. Not going to spoil who that character is because that's why the Martians are here. But um, it's because of that character. But great age stuff. Not bad at all. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Thank you very much. Good stuff. 
all new, I mean, Amazing X Men number 13. Uh, seeing a lot of DC, former DC writers jumping ship and coming over to Marvel now. This title brings James Tanyon the fourth over to Marvel. And um, in this issue, um, it's pretty much kind of a uh, like teaches you a lesson in this in terms of I know right here has basically been talking with this guy yes I know he's gay and he's talking to this guy about you know hooking up things like that um he, the guy does know that Anal is a mutant. However, Anal has not shown what he looks like because he has this fear, and it's cool because it kind of shows that even even mutants are having this fear of appearance, and of course the fact that Anal doesn't look quote unquote as he said one of the pretty mutants, basically mutants who don't look like someone like uh, a beast or a rock slide or you know. They look more like a, a, a rogue or a Psylocke and things like that, you know. Um, and we get to see the antagonist in this, and I was like, okay, this is interesting. And the antagonist seems to have been really extending her powers. I'm going to say, yeah, it is a her. And uh, really get some real down grade age stuff between Kurt and Anal, who Kurt can understand where Anal is coming from being the fact that he kind of grew up in that kind of prejudice and scaredness. I mean, he looks like a demon. However, good old Kurt always showcases that uh, you can't look at it's what counts in the inside, not the outside. Um, and North Star was, you know, he kind of showcases his, his own views as well. But um, this was a standalone issue. Not bad. Not bad at all. Logan Legacy number five. Uh, this is the Dokken story. I'm not the biggest Dokken fan, guys. I've, I've said it before. I've shitted on Dokken a lot of times, and I'm like, you know, I, I don't understand how is this doesn't make no sense. When did this kid happen? It's, you know, things like that. You know, screw him, you know, you know, I, I don't care about his sexual orientation, dude's bi, I don't care, it has no, no effect on me, but I just, he's never really been a character that has really intrigued me enough to really care about him, however, I must admit that uh, uh, Ray uh, Fox did a good job with this, this was very good, um, Elena uh, Bonetti, artwork in here was beautiful, beautiful artwork. Um, Dokken does some does something in this, and you're just like, wow. Um, I will spoil a little bit. The fact is, Dokken interrupts an auction that's being held in Madripoor. As you all know, Madripoor is where a lot of sleazy um, auctions go off and it's all about his dad and he literally does something and I'm just like you know you're like hmm, okay you know what I'll give you your credit here Dokken Dakin Dokken whatever however you pronounce it but um other than that you know I have nothing really more to say um still X-23 story has been the best out of this miniseries so far, um, down pat, I'm not even joking about that, and I think I'm not the only one that believes that. Uh, next one is Mystique, let's see what Raven thinks about Raven's death. New Avengers, uh, number 27, Hickman, um, a new artist on this one is, uh, what's, what's the new artist's name? Um, Simon Kodransky. I mean, his artwork was pretty decent. It very wasn't terrible. It was good, but um, 
once again, like I said, guys, in the Hallville, I had to read this twice. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out where to help. Literally, I, I can tell you right now, I can tell you that this has got to be some kind of um, alternate world or something like that. Because in this issue, Thor is wielding Mjolnir. And I'm like, okay, wait, wait a minute. If, how is that possible? You know? But it was good to see Doctor Strange. But it's just that, it's like, Mr. Hickman, you, you, when you make me do this, I know I look like a monkey doing that, but no. Instead of me like, hmm, okay. I mean, you had me at one point doing, hmm, with Mjolnir. Thor is wielding Mjolnir. I'm like, wait, how did he get Mjolnir? So truly, once again, this this time's running out storyline that's going in the, on in New Avengers and New Avengers, I'm clearly basically knowing that this is some sort of, you know, uh, alternate world or, or something. I, I don't know. Um... You just got to find out for yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. New Warriors number 12. I've collected every New Warriors series Marvel has put out. I remember the original from back in the 90s. Good stuff. All of them has ended either 12 to 24 issues. And that's sad. My mentor, Lou Goblin, said this to Marvel. Fuck you, Marvel, for canceling this book. Um, he has a point in a sense because it's like, Marvel, you, 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 you're shoving so many Avengers books, but you can't keep the Warriors right. Now, yes, I'm, I'm, I can't call... I can't be devil's advocate because because I'm guilty of buying a lot of the Marvel, the Avengers books. So, but still, it's like I couldn't this stay. This issue, really good, ended well. Um, literally, literally showcased how fucking powerful Justice really is. Vance Astrato, how strong he really is, how powerful his telekinetic powers really are. And starts to question, is he an Omega level mutant? You get to see him and the rest of the uh, team fight the Eternals. And the Eternals are kind of like the new gods of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, the, the Marvel Universe, not Cinematic Universe, sorry. Um, and you just see everybody fight, and Justice is just slowly walking up to their leader. No problem, like, you want to go? Let's do it. And we get to see that really shine well for justice in this issue. Um, now, this story is being told by justice to one Steve Rogers. And the end of it is really cool because it ends on a, a, a feel of like the new warriors are back, but we're not going to continue their story. So it's like. But I do give Chris Yost and everybody credit. But I will say, like, why, why, why you can't say this? Come on, man. Um, like I said, uh, Justice tells Steve Rogers that um, we're going to expand the team. And you get to see the expansion. New members are added. Uh, some veteran members. Uh, we have Rage, uh, Namorita, and uh, Night Thrasher. Now, I know right there that is not Dwayne Taylor, Night Thrasher. That's got to be his brother, Danielle Taylor, who took over the legacy after after Dwayne was killed to now. Never, you know where I'm going. Uh, but it's good to see Rage. And But this was good. Very good indeed. We're going to do this at the same time because it, it, it kind of... Um, kicks into uh, Spider-Verse. <coughs> so we got 
Scarlet Spiders, and Spider-Man 2099. In the Scarlet Spiders, we get to see, oh, which is written by uh, Kolska. Oh, you uh, uh, Mike Kolska, Kolska, and Paco Diaz does the artwork. In this issue, in the, the first issue of this miniseries, Scarlet Spider, the, the three clones have traveled to an alternate world where spiders are like is run by one guy. Even Tony Stark is under this guy. And it's almost like his butt monkey. Uh, Jessica Drew really shines in this issue while um, well, it was good to see Ben Riley and Kane, you know, everybody else like that. Um, good start, especially at the end of the issue, but um, a, a certain person who was with uh, the leader of the, the this earth. But um, other than that, not bad at all. Then we go into uh, Spider-Man 2099. Miguel, uh, six on Spider-Man, and Lady Spider who is May Parker um, from the year 18 the late 19th century uh, is back in the year 2099 and they're dealing with one of the inheritance who's followed them and we get a starling uh, there's a death in this issue um, one of the members of the trio is killed and it was kind of like, really? Wow. Um, but we get to find another interesting... Oh. Um, May Parker, Lady Spider, is um, not... has no powers. She's just all technology. And when the inherit... You know, when Marlon's family knows it, when he grabs her and he's like, you, you don't have any powers. You're not a spider totem. You just, you know, respect them, so you, and a lot of things happen there, but the way they defeat him, I was like, whoa, good, nice, very nice indeed, good stuff, oh my god, Superior Iron Man number two, we got a good Tom Taylor, sir, you already proven that this is a good series. That first issue had me intrigued. This makes it clear, like, you know what you're doing. You know that. You know what the hell you're doing. And uh, in this issue, first of all, we kind of got a glimpse of this fight in the last Axis. The app, the the app that uh, Tony, the the um, extremist app that Tony has is does everything to you however Daredevil is not really happy about it and he confronts Tony Tony drops him into the San Francisco Bay now the problem I have with that oh and speaking of which Tony's new headquarters is right above Alcatraz it's on Alcatraz Island really um, the problem I have with what what happened to Daredevil when he got thrown into the San Francisco Bay is the San Francisco Bay is known for having strong fucking currents. So I looked at that I'm like, how come Daredevil is not getting dragged, you know, completely out of range because of the because of the uh, you know because of the uh, the current. Um, But Daredevil says something cool. He says he hates water because it messes up his, his you know, his powers, his senses and things like that. And um, I thought that was really interesting to say. But um, we get to see that, yeah, Tony, Tony is really becoming a, a jerk and an asshole and things like that. And he's back to being that dick, dickish Tony Stark. Um, Daredevil gives another try. You know, 
tries to fight Tony on his own terms in the dark. However, Tony is ready for him, and we, he gets a, he he explains to Daredevil about his new armor and everything like that. And uh, it's the ending. You were just like, what? What did you do to Daredevil? Is it bad or is it good? You have to be decide to be the decider of that, guys. If you've read this issue, look good stuff. I skipped some issues. Um, I'm sorry, guys. But let me let me. I'll get back to those two that I skipped. Uh, Wolverine X Men, final issue, twelve. Um, look, basically, Storm is acting weird. Be, you know, she's still having the effects of what happened in Axis. Uh, Quentin Choir is is a dick, and it is what it is. It wasn't perfect. You know, it was just like I kind of felt a little like, like really like. That for a final issue, especially, but eh, it is what it is. Now, Captain America and the Mighty Avenger, Avengers. Um, you and and the gang do a good job with this. This still ties into Axis, um, as you all know. Um, you and brings back Blue Streak, but this time he's got a, a gang. Blue Streak has a gang called. Gold Rush, Gold Silver Ghost, Red Light, and Green Light, and and Blue Streak, and they call themselves. Get this, the Fast Five. And the Fast Five get their asses handed to them by the Mighty Avengers, Monica Rambo, uh, Blue Marvel, She Hulk, Power Man, Victor Alvarez, and White Tiger. Ava, just it was just terrible. This is like, wow, they made them look like quote unquote wrestling term here, lightweights or how do I say? I can I say mid carters? Nah, just look green, just put like that. However, because of what happened between Sam, who's been he's acting really much like a dick, <coughs> him and Tony are thinking of, are working on a plan to break down, destroy the Mighty Avengers, and Luke has been acting weird too. And Luke does something this that's just like, but yeah, I'm still intrigued. Deathlock number two, uh, Edmondson, Mr. Edmondson, not bad. Once again, uh, still keep that keep that born identity feel to this book. It works for this book. Um, not going to spoil too much for it. The the writing is really good. The artwork is great too. We you know it, you feel sorry for Henry Hayes when you know they, he's doing these missions as Deathlock, as the Deathlock, even though he thinks he's going to. Um, he's he works for um, he working for as a medic who goes into different you know um, war zone to provide you know aid relief to doesn't matter who that's what he thinks he's doing but he's not and they erase his memory and he wakes up like wait what the hell you know oh I'm late for some he's having problems with his daughter she, her grades are slipping things like that and Shield is still trying to figure out who he is and what, what happened to some of the original, especially uh, Michael Collins, who was a Deathlock as well. And then also comes that ending, guys, of who is coming in this book. And I was like, okay. All I'm going to say is that person, great. Mr. Edison, you're going with that person. However, I will give you guys a clue. Her last name is Thurman. There you go. So that is all the books I have for this this week, guys. 
Um, now it is time to do the surprise giveaway. I'm going to pull a name out of the hat to see who wins the prize for uh, the month of November. Um, like I said, um, whoever wins, expect, a, expect me to contact you via YouTube or if you are a Facebook friend, there um, with the information I'm going to need from you. Um, but let's do this, shall we? Let's do this. Okay, everybody who's commented on my vids since the last week of October and up to now, you've been entered into the hat. So we're going to shake this bad boy up. Okay. Shake it up. Let's shake it up again. And let's pull them out. And the winner is. Zack the Thunder King is the winner. All right, Zack. My friend Zack, you are the winner of the month of November's sweepstakes. Um, I will be contacting you, Zack. What I can tell you what the gift is, it is an omnibus. Um, which company? You'll get to know that. I will tell you that too. From Dynamite. What title? I'm not telling you. But you, I hope you enjoy the gift when I, but when I, I'm going to need when I talk to you. Uh, just tell me where you would like me to talk to you. Here on YouTube or I believe we're friends on Facebook. Um, but if not, just tell me. But um, other than that, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. We start the process all over again. December. So, so from now until this, the last week of December, which is which is uh, I. I guess I'll be able to do it. I guess the 28th or so. That'll be when, whenever I get it out. Um, that's when I'll tell you guys. Um, that'll be the next. Um, I think what I'm gonna do for the next. Um, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do for the next. The next prize I will do for the next will involve my local comic shop, um, my local comic store, Midtown Comics. Um, so. But other than that, you guys take care. I'll see you guys next time. Stay tuned as always, guys. And this is the Omni Geek High Lord of New York saying peace and love. Stay tuned. Keep real, guys, as always. I shall see you guys next time. Take care. Say bye, Gwen. She's shy. Take care, guys.